Hello, I'm Paul Beckwith, and I'm continuing um, my discussion of basically of plots on a lot of different aspects of climate change, just to give you sort of an update on the state of the climate using um, a lot of the graphics that have been produced by James Hansen over the years, and these are, these are updated uh, frequently. Um, so finishing off, uh, or, or beginning from where I finished off in last video, I'll talk about the atmospheric uh, greenhouse gas abundances. Okay, so this is the uh, CO2 curve and, uh, you know, running up here, you know, we're, we're well over, you know, 410 parts per million is the abundance in the atmosphere in the monitoring station at Mauna Loa in Hawaii. Um, this is the annual increase and we're pushing about 2.5 or so is the trend parts per million per year going above three dipping down to slightly under two so there's variation in the yearly increase um, but it's depicted here nicely so this is the month down here january through december so this is one year is one uh, file here um, and along the rows it's the years and here we are in 2020, so um, we've, this, is, this is the range. So in this brown color, for example, here, the CO2 has increased between 3 and 3.5 parts per million um, in this particular time. Um, so, so, for, so for March of 2020, we increased in this range. Um, and in February, it would be 2.5 to 3. If every month was like February, it'd be 2.5 to 3 parts per million and so on. So you can see, you know, large increases here, uh, slightly smaller increases here. Um, you know, very, very large increases in 2016 when there was a very strong El Nino. Oceans were very warm. They didn't absorb as much uh, CO2 from the atmosphere. Uh, so the atmospheric levels were, were higher, less was going into the oceans. And you can see the general trend line, you know, as the, so the rate of, of uh, CO2 increase in the atmosphere is increasing, uh, you know, much faster than linearly. And you can see that here by looking at the overall color shift here to higher and higher amounts, where you can look at it from this plot here, um, or you can look at it from, from this plot here. Okay, uh, we can look at this for uh, CO2, um, for methane as well, uh, but you know, you can look at, this is the, um, this is the El Ninos is the positives, and La Ninos is the negatives here. So you can look at the, um, so when there's a very, very strong El Nino, like I said, the oceans are warmer and they're absorbing less CO2, so less of the emissions are going into the ocean, more of the emissions are staying in the atmosphere. So the atmospheric levels were ri you know, rising, you know, sort of record levels, um, you know, in these particular months in 2016, while the strong El Nino was going on. Um, if you look at, uh, we can look at methane um, as well. And this is a methane curve increasing, flattening out a bit, increasing. You can see, you know, that the this is the change in parts per billion per year. So it was over, it was about 12, dropping down close to no change, and it's been increasing again. It's about seven or eight pp parts per billion per year. I mean, I said parts per million, parts per billion per year. You can see this is so. If you linearize the plot here, you can see, you know, it was high here, dropped off, and it's increasing again. And this is the plot in this case, very high levels here, dropping to low levels around 2000-ish and increasing strongly um, since then, but not at the same level yet as the, uh, as the increase in the, in the uh, 80s to uh, you know, mid 80s to mid 90s. Okay, if you look at uh, nitrous oxide, you can see the same sort of rise here um, it's more, it's flatter. This is the rise. It's slightly, it's just under about one parts per billion per year typically. But the global warming potential, of course, for methane is much higher than for CO2, depending on the time frame. And it's very, very high for, for nitrous oxide. And if you could look at other trace gases and see what they're doing as well. 
So uh, CFCs, CFC12, CFC11, um, HCFC, et cetera. You can look at some of the other gases. And some of these gases have extremely high global warming potentials. So even though the concentrations are very low, the, the, um, they, ha they do have a significant effect. And here is what we see. This is a trend line for the forcing in watts per square meter of the actual greenhouse gases. So you can see that we've exceeded the two watts per square meter here. Okay, um, this is the greenhouse gas forcing growth rate. So the change in forcing watts per meter squared for the different uh, gases. So CO2, then methane on top of that, then nitrous oxide here, um, and then the um, low concentration, very high um, global warming potential uh, trace gases on top of that. So you can see the, the trends, um, the changes uh, per year. Okay, um, the El Nino and La Nina. Okay, uh, this is the plots over time, the temperature anomaly in the ocean of the sea surface temperature. Um, and I'm being attacked by a cat, sorry. Um, and you can see that, uh, you know, in 2015, 2016, very powerful El Nino, almost three degrees Celsius temperature anomaly in the ocean. Um, and, uh, you know, right now we, we've been kind of, we're kind of in a neutral state. We were a little bit high here, but nothing to write home about. And that's plotted in this sort of fashion from 1950 to 2020, just depicted in a, a different way here. So these are the temperatures. So this is the 2016, you know, the temperatures reached in the different months. Um, so El Nino here, El Nino here. El Nino here, and, and then the blue areas are the La Ninas, which usually follow quickly after an El Nino, but not always. Not in this case, for example, but over here, it, it, this, this followed the 1996 El Nino. This La Nina followed the 1985-86 El Nino, and 1972, I guess, or 71. El Nino followed by a powerful La Nina and so on. So you can see, you know, the, the patterns there. This is the, uh, the winter during strong El Ninos where the temperature anomalies are. So you can see this pattern. This is the characteristic signature, very strong ocean warming here. This is the 2015, 2016 uh, El Nino or super El Nino. And then the 97, 98 one here. 82, 83, strong one here. So you can see the patterns uh, here. Um, and there's also precipitation anomalies, millimeters per day. So the blue area is getting more rain and the red area is getting less rain. Um, and then the La Niñas, you can look at the same sort of thing when those are occurring. Okay, so there's lots of data there. This is global precipitation, how it changes. Um, so this is the 81 to 2010, the mean monthly total precipitation in the different months globally. Okay, so there's lots of data there. Um, this is the uh, drought, uh, U.S. drought in, in various years. So the f area, the percentage of the U.S. under very severe drought is the under exceptional drought here is the brown and under extreme drought is the red and the orange is severe and so on the levels of different drought um, and the spatial distribution etc uh, the wind patterns around the the planet um, very good if you want to set up uh, wind turbines you know put them up in the north atlantic for example to capture those very very high winds uh, hurricanes, number of hurricane landfalls uh, in con the continental U.S. per, per decade. Um, so this is, uh, you know, 2017, 2018. You know, we had Harvey and Irma, Michael. Okay, um, you can see the, you know, try to look for trends. This is the total number. So this is hurricanes hitting, you know, making landfall in the continental U.S. And this is the hurricanes that are generated in the 
Atlantic. So you can see the trend is to, you know, more category five. So as the sea surface temperature increases, when it gets to 26.5 degrees Celsius, then the energy from the ocean can go into the atmosphere and, and uh, fuel these massive hurricanes, you know, the high category hurricanes. So you can see the trend from the 1850s to the 2000s of increasing numbers of the high, these are the high, the very powerful strong storms, category three, category four, category five. And then you can see the uh, landfalls and there's something called the accumulated cyclone energy in the Atlantic basin. And you can see there's more and more accumulated uh, cyclone energy, stronger storms. Okay, uh, tornadoes, this is the number of tornadoes. Um, and, uh, you know, in this region here, you know, we maybe weren't seeing all of the tornadoes, but there's, you know, since 2000, we're not missing too many. There's lots of storm chasers out there and you can see, um, you know, the months that they occur in. So January to March is the blue. Most of them are in April to June. Some of them in July to September. So basically we're getting them you know, in October to December. So we're getting them year round. Um, and uh, this is in the US, we're getting them year round, but there's, you know, tornado season, April to June, um, mostly. Okay, so you can see the trend. Um, and there is, a, there is a fit here. So we're, it looks like we're getting slightly more of them. Okay, this is wildfires, total acreages, acres burned in the US and global mean sea level change. You can see, you know, the, the fit here, you know, you could argue that in the last uh, five, 10 years or so, that there's an uptick here in the slope. Okay, um, this is 93 to 2020, 3.4 millimeters per year, 1930 to 1992 was about 1.4 millimeters per year and 0.6 millimeters a year from 1900 to 1930. You can do piecewise linear fits, and you can see that, you know, it's it's increasing. One of the reasons is the Greenland is shedding more ice, Antarctica is shedding more ice, the ocean's warming, so the expansion of the ocean, all those things contribute to sea level rise. If you look at the ice mass change rate of Greenland, you can see that it was increasing significantly. You know, interestingly, the melt rate really decreased to here and then it's starting to get more larger. If you do a fit through it, the best doubling fit is about 10 years. Antarctica, this is the change. Again, the best doubling fit is about uh, 10 years. And you can see, you know, more and more melting here, and then it jumped up and then it's jumped back down again. So this needs to be looked at, you know, why did the melt rate, why did, why, is, why did it do this? Why did it have this big fluctuation here? I'm not sure, I have to investigate that um, in more detail. Uh, this is the sea ice area, you know, in the Arctic and in the Antarctic, lots of data. You know, I'll have to do a separate video on this soon. Species loss, Hansen likes the monarch butterflies, so he's been tracking the rates of it. So it looked, it dropped precipitously here in 2013, 2014, and it's somewhat, it's recovered a little bit, but it remains to be seen if this is a real recovery or just a little reprieve. I've talked about the fossil fuel CO2 emissions already, energy consumption, carbon intensity, radiative forcings, uh, you know, there's all kinds of different stuff in the stratosphere, uh, the aerosol optical thickness. And of course, you know, if there's volcanoes then there's more aerosols in the stratosphere and they can cause some cooling. Um, this is a couple smaller, this is from 2000 to 2012, the data, and it shows a couple uh, volcanoes here adding to the aerosol loading. Okay, and that's depicted also here. Um, and of course, with the coronavirus, the aerosol loading has gone way down. Then there's the tropospheric aerosols, uh, which are more contributing to air pollution. Um, and then there's uh, paleo, some paleoclimate stuff, um, you know, sea level change long term. And uh, so, so this is a great site, loads of data. Have a look at it yourself. And thank you for listening. Bye for now.